Good afternoon. Welcome to the Advanced WMS webinar series. Um, my name is Shanna Blackstone. I work in the WMS department here at VIP. Um, today we are going to talk about location-based inventory and this is part two. Uh, we did call it troubleshooting originally, but I'm actually going to do a part three, I decided, because we have so much to talk about. Um, so next month we're going to get in more uh, more in depth on troubleshooting, but today we're going to talk about some more concepts, um, just so we're all on the same page. Um, this really is focused for anybody who's new to LBI, meaning that um, you've never um, had any LBI exposure. Maybe you're not your company's not using it, or maybe you're new to the company, or you've changed positions, anything like that. Um, this is also uh, these will be great webinars for retraining if you do hire uh, new people out in the warehouse or even in the office, just so they kind of understand what location-based inventory is. And um, this is a webinar. You are on mute, but you can type in any questions. Uh, yet again, I have lots of information. So it's going to be a bit, but if you want to go back and watch any of these, you always can. They're on the support site. Um, when we're done, any Q&A that I don't get to, uh, we send you out that copy as well um, with the answers. And um, I'm also going to try and start sending the PowerPoint um, slides because I've had a lot of requests for those as well. So let's go ahead and get started. What I thought I would do is just a quick review, um, in case you didn't attend last um, months, just a quick review of what location-based inventory is, because it is very different than basic inventory in VIP. But what it allows you to do is actually track your product by location and code date. So not just pick locations, but literally every location in your warehouse, uh, back stocks, um, forward pick, staging locations, so on and so forth. And all of your product is made up into what we call layers. Um, so for some of you, you might think the word layer and you think layer picker or the claw line or a layer um, of inventory on a pallet or a like a tier, um, but when it's location-based inventory, when I say the word layer, what I'm really meaning is something that's made up of three different things. Um, it's a product that is in a location, has a code date, and then has some kind of quantity with it. So um, if you are non-LBI, you have a total amount of inventory. So you have 500 cases in this example I'm kind of showing you guys here. If you uh, turn LBI on, what that allows you to do is see the layers of inventory. So you can see everywhere it exists in your warehouse and all the code dates associated with it. But again, you still have that total amount of 500 cases. So um, some of the topics we're going to go over today, I'm just going to do a quick review of what you can do in Easy Ops, even if you are LBI. We're going to talk about the daily inventory process. And then we're going to get into picking depletion method, um, what is that exactly what does that mean um, when it comes to LBI? So let's go ahead and just start with easy ops in general. I want to let you guys all know if you are V14 plus, you're using LBI or even not using LBI, um, you can use the receiving application in easy ops. I did a webinar on it back in February, so feel free to kind of go back and take a look at that. Um, I did a webinar on without ASNs. I'm gonna do another one coming up here at some point with ASN so that you guys can kind of see it. Um, it's not crazy different, but I just wanna make sure that everyone's on the same page um, as to how that all works. Um, again, you can use it with LBI. Something else you can do uh, for Easy Ops is you can use the that program to move product around. So for any of you already on LBI um, or you know that you have to move product from one location to another, you can do that also with the Easy Ops program. Um, we've gotten really good feedback about that. People like the screens, they like the way it looks. Um, and the cool part is even if you have RF units, you can use those simultaneously with Easy Ops. And then last but not least, what's uh, helpful as well is we've put the upkeep of the locations also on Easy Ops. Um, things like capacity, replenishment increments, replenishment triggers. I did a uh, webinar way back when on replenishment, improving replenishment, and that went over all those features there that again is uh, something you get to use when you turn LBI on. And also on the Easy Ops program, you can also assign pick locations. All of these things you can do on the RF units as well. We're just kind of letting you know what we're slowly rolling over um, into uh, that process. So 
Um, let's go ahead and talk about what we would consider the daily inventory process when you go forward with LBI. So when you turn location-based inventory on, it becomes uh, a much more strict concept when you're actually doing inventory. And I kind of want to go over what VIP would consider our best practices. So one of the first things you really should be doing every morning, uh, either prior to counting or prior to making adjustments with counting, is really reviewing your staging areas. Um, I'm going to show you the LOC PR LOC report and how to review those. If you have any breakage or adjustments that need to be made, so basically product that needs to get out of or be brought back into your inventory, I would encourage you to do that um, before you count or before you review uh, your counts in general. It's gonna make it a lot easier. We're also gonna review how to count the pick. Um, I say count the pick because um, with location-based inventory, you get a lot more flexibility where you don't have to count all of your locations. We're also gonna talk about how to address variances in VIP, like what program you would actually be using. How to investigate those variances. Let's say we've done our second count and we still have variances, how do we look those up? And then how to make adjustments in general. Now the investigation of variances, I do wanna let you guys know, I'm gonna go a deep dive into that in part three next month and we're gonna spend a lot of time in IQ InVen as well. So uh, let's kind of start from the beginning. Uh, the report we were talking about, the LOC PR LOC report is gonna help you to review those staging areas we were talking about. So in last month's webinar, we looked at these different kind of staging locations, talked about what some of them were. We talked about good, bad, FX BAL. Um, the default no LOC location, that's actually a pretty important one. Anytime you do not enter a location, um, doing some type of transaction with inventory, the VIP system is going to use a default uh, location. And that really is kind of up to you what you call it. I've seen usually it's either a star or no look or a default. Some other people have their own naming conventions for it. And that's actually set up with a Z control. You're also gonna see me um, talk about the very location today. But either way, all of these locations really should be for the most part, empty before you start counting or before you start making adjustments. It's gonna make your life a lot easier when you're going through this piece. Now, the only two I'm gonna hesitate about is pallet and empty. Those are really tracking our dunnage. Those don't have to be, um, have no layers in them. They actually just are for obviously tracking those, those particular pieces of the system. So let's take a look at what look, PR look looks like. So I have run the report and I've run it on just a single location. So the default location is all I'm looking at here. And you can see that I've got my items, my description. I can see all the different code dates and then I can see what's on hand in this location. Now in my mind, the default location should have nothing in here. It really is more of a, oops, I forgot to put something in. I need to address it later. So how would I go about figuring out why is product in here? Well, it really comes down to identifying um, the items and then going into IQ InVen. So in the example I'm going to give here, this is a pretty good one. I've got an item. It's got 56 cases on hand. I know that's probably a full palette. I can see that there's a default code date as well. So I'm thinking, all right, maybe something happened during a receiving process. So all I have to do is go into IQ InVen, and I want to go into the audit logs. So if you aren't familiar with this, we're going to get familiar with that, uh, particularly next month. But really, if I dig in, I can actually see pretty easily that someone did a receipt in Key InVen um, for 56 cases, and they forgot to put in a location and a code date. I see the default code date, I see the default location. Um, obviously this allows me to address that user and say, hey, remember when we're receiving, we wanna make sure we put in the locations the product needs to go to. And if I needed to change this at this point, it's pretty simple. I could use EasyOps or I could use RF loc key to move the product into the appropriate uh, location. Um, another reason I might be using low PR low is I want to look at those star FX valves. Remember, we talked about that last month. They are important. They're not a bad thing. It's balancing your on hand to your layer file. But if I do want to go and kind of review one of them, I'm going to go ahead and just take this first item. And one of the first things I'm going to do is I'm going to go right to IQ InVen. I'm going to look at the layer file. And this example here, I'm, I'm checking out the quantities, I'm seeing my locations, and I notice right away, here's my quantities, but right up top, I've got a star FX bell of a negative one, and I've got two in star good. 
okay? So I'm just gonna keep that in the back of my mind uh, looking at this here, and I'm gonna do a little more investigation. The other thing I'm gonna pay attention to is the total of the layers. I wanna make sure that the total of my layers, 299 cases, matches my on hand. So let's go ahead into the audit log. We're gonna go right into uh, IQ and Ben's audit. And the first thing I'm gonna look at is the current on hand. Does this amount match my layers? It does, great, I can move along. I know that star FX file was there for a reason. One of the things I can see right away, because I'm investigating right the day after, that's the important part of why you wanna investigate every single day if you can, um, is because I can tell in here that I've got product that came back in to star good. Now, when you're looking at IQ Invent and you're looking at the audit log here, I'm not viewing the layer file. I'm viewing the on hand amounts, okay? So I can see only one case actually came back into on hand. So that's where I got that star FX spell because if I look back at the layer file, it said there were two cases that actually came back into star good. Again, if I keep all of these staging locations clean every day, I will know that the next morning, whatever's in there happened from the previous night. It makes it a lot easier for me. Now let's say that you wanna find out, did really one case come back? Did two case coming back? How do I know the on hand is right versus the layer file? Um, it's pretty simple. You guys do have reports reports that are available during the recon process. You can access those reports the next morning, take a look. Uh, maybe someone writes down everything that came back in. But again, these are the things that you wanna do to investigate and make sure these staging locations are clean for the next day so it's easy um, to check things. So one of the other things you wanna take care of in the morning um, during your inventory process is breakage and adjustments. I also have returns to supplier here in parentheses. You don't have to take care of that necessarily in the morning. But what I'm about to show you is often I see an issue happen when people are um, processing their breakage adjustments and even returns to suppliers. Uh, basically, what I've got here is an example of the on-hand file before I actually process a breakage transaction. And the transaction I'm looking to do is I'm gonna remove six cases. I'm gonna remove them. Um, I want them broken out of the pick, basically, that happened last night. And um, when I do that, what I want to show you here is what usually happens in the system is all of a sudden I get this negative layer in the default layer. And I've got this negative six cases, I've still got 56 in the pick and 100 in back stock. And the reason this happens is because often people remember to put in, of course, how much product they wanna remove and they'll put in a reason code of why they're removing it or maybe they're even adding it back. But they often forget to put in a location and a code date. And the location and code date that you choose have to be real locations and code dates that are in your layer file. Uh, I get requests from people basically saying, you know, why isn't this required? It is something I can make required for the key in-ven process, um, but usually once we make it required, we get feedback from the office, oh, please make this optional, you know, we don't, we don't, wanna, we don't know where to pull this from, so on and so forth. Um, but we can make it required for key in-ven. Unfortunately, with RF key inv or, um, Yes, with RFK and we can't actually make that required at this time. So it is something that you do have to pay attention to when you're actually processing your breakage adjustments and even returns to supplier as well. When I'm actually doing the uh, return, or excuse me, the adjustments or the breakage, I'm out on the floor, I'm using RF key inv. It's easy to put in the item, put in the cases, put in a reason code, and then just process it and not even think about it. But you want to make sure you're going to enter that code date and you're going to enter that. But what I hear a lot of is, well, I don't know what layers I have or what code dates I have and that kind of thing. I try to enter it and it says invalid inventory. Well, I'm gonna show you a really easy way to figure this out. When you're in RF key inv, and whether you're doing a breakage or an adjustment, as soon as you put the item number in, what I want you to do is I want you to go down to the location section. And when you're on this line, you can actually press the F4 button. And what that'll do is allow you to see a list of all the layers that are associated with this item. That then allows you to select one of those layers. And you can see here that the code date and the location are gonna be filled in for you 
all then you have to do is break out the cases and put in a reason code. And then you're not gonna have any of these negative default locations um, in your layer file. Okay, so let's move on to counting inventory. So when you turn LBI on, um, no longer are you restricted to RF count and 5R, you have the ability to use these two new programs called RF task and RF vary. Now, RF task is going to be used to do your first count. So basically you create tasks with a program called Phi count, and we'll talk about that a little bit more next month. Um, but basically these tasks then are uh, completed by your inventory personnel. Um, you may have heard me talk about this before. Uh, I did remember we spoke earlier about the improving replenishment webinar I did way back in 2016. RF task is used to do replenishment tasks, but also counting tasks as well. So if that's kind of stuck there, you're thinking about that, that's we're going to the same exact uh, program. Once you've completed your first count, any variances that are created by that first count are then taken care of with a program called RF vary. Okay, so basically what it's saying is, did I go to that location, whatever I counted in that location, does it match the total amount in the layer file for just that location? So it gives you a lot of flexibility using these programs. And then on top of that, I can actually use that same program to adjust the layers and the on hand. So here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, visuals are great. Um, so I'm gonna go over two examples here. I'm gonna go over using RF task and RF vary and how to address a bad replenishment from the night before. And then I'm gonna show you in a second example how to actually adjust product out when we find that product is actually missing from inventory. Um, so I am gonna give credit where it's due. Uh, Justin Tugis, who I work with in the WMS department, actually created all of these awesome slides uh, for me here um, for some internal training. So uh, he came up with all these great visuals for you guys. So we're gonna set the scene. We are in a warehouse and we have some racking. Now the lower section of the racking is the pick locations. And then the top section of the racking would be considered the backstock locations. Um, remember when you turn location-based inventory on, every single pallet position uh, can have a location ID. So that's what I'm showing you guys here is everything has a, its own location. So in our example here, it's the start of the day, and we have a product that happens to be in three locations. It's in a pick and two backstock locations with a total quantity. And throughout the day, obviously, your salesmen are going to send in orders, and we have orders for 25 cases coming in. So what's going to happen here is that night, all right, your picker is going to come along, and he's going to pick some product. Now, that was an order for 25 cases. There was only 21 there, so he's going to pick the 21, he's going to short the product, and then he's going to go off on his way to finish the pick path. Now, he's going to either call to or create a replenishment task uh, for the forklift driver. Forklift driver is going to show up, and he is going to pull product from one location in backstock and bring it down to the pick location. Okay, so now we've got the pick location full and he drives away. But unfortunately, that forklift driver forgot to do, he forgot to actually use the, um, the excuse me, the RF unit to actually say that he's moving the product from one location to another or even easy ops to do that. The picker's gonna come along, he's gonna pick up the rest of the product that he's missing and he's gonna be on his way, okay? Then at some point later on that night when picking is complete, you guys are going to invoice. After invoicing, I want you to notice that this is what the layer file is actually going to look like in VIP. You have a negative in your pick location and you have a positive 72 cases still in Bravo Bravo, that backstock location. Okay, so the next morning, your inventory personnel come in all right, and they are going to be counting. Now, we're gonna take a look here. Reality is um, the pick location has 68 cases. Um, Charlie Charlie has 72 cases, but in VIP, in the layers, we're still off. We have the same total amount, um, but something is wrong. We have a negative in our pick. So we're gonna go ahead and count. We're gonna use the RF task feature to count. So all you're going to do is put a six on the line, press enter, and any tasks that you need to complete will actually show up on the screen. So we're going to put our cursor on physical counts. We're going to simply hit enter, and we have one physical count to complete. It happens to be this product right here. 
So when we put our cursor on the line and we hit enter, it's gonna tell us to go to that location. So we're gonna go to Alpha 101. And we are going to go to that location and start counting it. So you can see we have no physical count and we cannot see the on hand. We're doing a blind count at this point. So in here, I'm gonna go ahead and count that location. I'm gonna put in 68 cases in the pick location. So I'm gonna hit enter. I'm gonna hit enter one more time. And you're gonna see the layer file actually changes right at this time. Okay, so now I I have 68 cases in A101. If I were to look that up in IQ Invent, I would see that. But at the same time, I have a very location that just appeared. So we're gonna take care of that next. So I'm done counting, I've got no more tasks. Now either I go out again and I use RF Very, or someone else goes out and does a second round of counting with RF Very. So on the screen here, I'm going to put a four on the line and simply hit enter. And what this program does is it looks for any layers or any quantity in the very location. So I've actually created that when I was in RF task. Now I'm in here, I'm going to go ahead and check this item. It's really simple to use RF very. It really is just about walking to the locations you see on the screen and counting what you see there. So the first location it's going to direct me to is Alpha 101. I'm going to go there and I'm going to recount. 68 cases, that's what the screen says. I don't have to do anything. Okay. I'm then going to go to Bravo Bravo 101. I'm supposed to count 72 cases there, but look, there's nothing there. So what do I need to do? I need to adjust this. So I'm going to hit enter here. And on this next screen, where the cases section are, I need to actually say that there is nothing there. So I'm going to blank that out. When I do that and I hit enter again, notice my variance is gone. My layers now match reality. So at this point, because I have no variance, I could just stop. I've fixed everything. I have the right amount of product. Or if I wanted to, I could always continue, continue on to Charlie Charlie and count what's there and confirm the rest of that product. If I'm done, I back out. There's no more variances. I have no more very layers and I'm done counting with RF Vary. Okay, so I'm gonna do the same thing again, um, but I'm gonna show you how to actually adjust a variance. So basically we are off by that amount and we need to make the on hand actually match what's in the layer file, what's actually on floor as well. So here we go, we're gonna count. I'm gonna move through this a little quicker, just so you know. I've got my layers, I've got a back stock and a forward pick location. I'm gonna go and say, here's what reality is. I actually only have 25 cases in the pick location. So I'm gonna go out with RF task and I'm gonna go ahead and put the six on the line. I'm gonna count. I have a physical count right here. I'm gonna say, okay, I've got that same product. I'm being told to walk to the same location. There I am. Once I get there, I'm gonna count how much I see. So at this point in time, I see 25 cases, not 28. Count that amount and I am done. There's no more tasks for me to complete. Then. Uh, either myself or someone else will now go and run RF Vary. And you can see here my layers are off by three cases. I've created a Vary layer. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and count. I can see this item right here. I'm still off by three cases. Now if for any reason what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the locations that I see. I'm going to go to Alpha 101 and I'm going to count it. 25. I see 25 on the screen. I see 25 there. I don't have to do anything. Then I can go to Charlie Charlie and ensure that there are 72 cases there. Yes, there's a full pilot, I'm good to go. If for any reason I were to find those three cases or any amount of that product anywhere else, I can actually enter a new count with the screen by hitting the F2, um, the function feature, and add in that new location, code date, and that product as well. But in this case here, I'm not gonna find the product. I'm actually gonna be off by three cases and I want to make the adjustment. So you can see at the bottom of the screen here, I can actually do one of two things. I can put an A on the, align to, on the line to adjust, or I could put a T on the line if I wanted to create a new task and have someone go count again, just to kind of ensure that they've counted all of that, uh, all of that product. If I put an A on the line here, I'm gonna do so, hit enter, and what's gonna happen is my layers now match my reality, and I've also adjusted my on hand as well. So I have 97 cases in the layers, I have 97 cases on the floor, and I have 97 cases in my on hand amount. So 
that is true cycle counting with LBI. Um, I do have a few tips for you guys. I encourage you to actually count the pick every day. Um, the pick is where you have the most movement from, not so much the back stock. Um, I do encourage you guys to not move product in and out of very. Please don't move that without using the RF very tool. Um, you're going to have a lot of issues with your layer file. And last but not least, um, I also encourage you to make the adjustments. If what you have on your floor is what you've actually counted, make VIP match that. Um, try not to run auto slot on the very location because it's basically just hiding the missing inventory um, that you're trying to uh, adjust for. If you find the inventory later, great. Make the adjustment, bring it back into inventory and everything's good to go. Okay. The last thing I want to go over when it comes to counting is RF count and 5R. I know some of you are still using this with LBI environments. Um, I know some of you also use it as your end of month or maybe as your end of year process instead of doing RF task and RF um, vary. What I want you to remember is you have to count all the locations of product exist in. So technically you can still cycle count. You can still count certain products on certain days but you can't just count it by one location like we were doing before. You have to count everything, um, everywhere it exists, pick locations, back stock locations, staging locations. Um, this is why I often recommend taking care of those staging locations beforehand, running that loc PR loc, moving the product where it actually needs to be, doing any breakage and adjustments because you're going to have a lot, lot easier time reading that 5R report. Also, I want you to understand the 5R report compares to the layer file, not the on-hand file. So if your layer file and your on-hand file do not match, all right, when you make an adjustment, it's going to adjust the layer file by that amount and it's going to adjust the on-hand file by that amount and you could cause yourself inflated or, or missing inventory um, by not having those two files match. This is why that IY local process we went over in last month is very important. We need those star FX files to make sure everything matches. Okay, so the last thing I'm probably going to go over here is work loc math. All right, so some of you might have heard of this before, some of you might know exactly what it does or have no idea what it does, um, but this is a very important piece of the system when it comes to determining where the product is going to be depleted from or quote unquote picked from um, when you run certain programs. So this program in general is really a filter. So it says based on certain options, I would like product to be depleted from these specific locations. So I have quite a few options and here are just a general um, selection here. Um, code date, do I always wanna pick the oldest code date or do I wanna pick the newest code date? Now, most of you are probably saying, well, I always wanna get the oldest code date, but let's say I'm doing transfers to warehouses, um, to other warehouses, maybe I always wanna go for the newest code date for those uh, transfers. Um, I also get to decide where does the product come from? Does it only come from a pick location? Can it come only from back stock locations? Um, am I lo always looking for the oldest code date? So like kegs, that's a great example. Maybe kegs, you have them all in one room, so you just always want to look for the oldest code date. You don't want to set up pick locations for them. Or do I set up a threshold? Now, a lot of you using LBI have this threshold set for full pallets to come from backstop. That way you don't deplete your forward pick line so quickly throughout the night and have to do a bunch of replenishing. You also have the ability to set up um, these filters with P sets and A sets as well. Um, this is what a typical work loc meth would be for those just starting out. It's pretty straightforward. I have um, defaults for beer soda or anything I sell by the case, and then wine defaults or anything I sell by the eaches. Um, you can see here in my beer soda default, I happen to be using a threshold. It's probably a Ford pick um, for most of my product, except full pallets come from backstock. And in either of these cases, I'm not using any A sets or P sets. So this is a generic way of easily reading what I see here. Now, if I want to create a new location, or excuse me, create a new filter or um, edit an existing, I can always do that. 
when I create a new filter, I have a lot of options on the screen. Um, so we always encourage you to reach out to VIP. We can help you um, with any of these setup and going through things. But uh, remember at any time in the legacy screens, if you put your cursor in any of these fields or radio buttons, you can always hit the help button and it'll actually explain to you from the knowledge base, what does that field mean? What would I actually be putting into that field? So a lot of different things to choose from here. And again, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to VIP and we can help you set this up. Now, what I want you to understand is what work loc meth, um, what programs actually access this, all right? This has nothing to do with replenishment. It only has to do with where product is going to be depleted from. So the programs that you are using, if you're using any truck diagramming programs, PalBuild, WebTL, or you're using the PickList, PickPal, um, generating those from the web, those are all going to use workload math to decide where your product is going to be picked from. Now, if you're not using any of those three, when you actually generate invoices, this process will actually use work loc math to decide where that product is coming from as well. If you're using one of the top three, um, when you generate the invoices, it's not gonna look at it again, it already has been decided. But um, for those of you who aren't accessing, you know, a truck diagramming program, or maybe you're just picking from invoices at this point in time, um, that still has the ability to access this uh, work loc math. What does not access work loc math are any of these listed on the screen here. So ranker, preloads, new loads. If you're doing any type of quote unquote pedal cell, or maybe you add cases to the truck in the morning, none of that is going to hit your, your layer file. None of that is going to deplete. So there is a huge possibility that you could have some concerns when you actually invoice this product because you've picked it from one location but when the invoice actually runs, it uses work loc math and pulls it from a completely different location. So we highly encourage you not to use these if you're using LBI. Um, give us a call. We can work out maybe some of the other processes before and figure out what's going on. If you do need to do a driver cell, um, pedal cell type of truck, we are encouraging you to do something different. It's basically, you're gonna pre-sell that truck with one invoice. Now that one invoice, you're gonna go out on the road, you're gonna avoid that invoice, and then you can create more invoices from the inventory that's now available on the truck. What you must understand is when you avoid that invoice, all of that product will be returned to the star good location. Then uh, once you create the new invoices, when those are uploaded to VIP, that's gonna run work loc meth again later that day and potentially virtually commit product from locations that it was not physically depleted from. So I know that's a lot to think about. So what I wa wanted to do is give you a bit of a visual for this. So here's our example here. We've got, um, we've got some uh, Duff beer. It's 25 cases per pallet, so that's a full pallet. We've got um, some in the pick location, some in a back stock location. Um, we have some code dates associated with it. And this right here is after we've already invoiced, okay? So we've already created the one invoice. And here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pre-sell 30 cases to one invoice for that truck. Now, again, I'm just using 30 cases because as an example here, your invoice would probably have hundreds of cases on it because you'd pre-sell to the entire truck. So here we're gonna do is go ahead and load up those cases. He's got the one uh, invoice on his handheld and he's gonna go off for the day. So while he's out on the road, he's going to void that one invoice and then he's going to create new invoices. So when he comes back, he's gonna take his handheld and he's going to upload to VIP. Now when he uploads to VIP, all right, this is what the system is going to look like, okay? So, oops, uh, apologies there. We're gonna actually have um, committed product. You can see that product is coming back into the good location. I've got all 30 cases that he had came back into Star Good. But because he did sell all of that product, it's committing itself again. So it's going to be committed from, in this case, I have my example is he sold it to two retailers. He sold five cases to one retailer and he sold 25 cases to another retailer. Because he sold 25 cases to another retailer, Work loc meth used the threshold to pull that from back stock and not the forward pick. So we've got some that are committed from A101 and some that are committed from Bravo Bravo 101. 
Now, what I want you to understand is that none of this is actually um, official. None of this actually comes out of your inventory until you run register that night or for those of you who run it next morning, it doesn't actually happen until next morning. So once register is run, you can see here, this is what's gonna happen. Those invoices are gone, right? But I still have 30 cases in star good because again, it had to be a plus and minus. I really went out on the truck. I had already depleted my inventory yesterday, but technically I did the void. I resold those, so everything has to balance out. So this is another one of those things that I see when people do voids, not understanding where is that product going? Why is it coming back? Why do I have something star good? But when I go and actually count star good the next morning, I have nothing actually there. So that's where I'm gonna stop today. That was a lot of concepts. I'm gonna go ahead and open it up to questions. And let me just see here, it takes me a second to open this. Okay. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so I may have missed this. Um, on the RF guns, sometimes there's a highlighted number on the left side that prevents a user from removing that highlighted amount out of the pick location. Just curious as to what creates that number. So that's a really good question. Um, for those of you who um, kind of need to visualize it, basically if you're an IQN VIN or even if you're in the RF unit, there is a committed column. And basically that product has been committed to some type of task. Now, uh, some of those might be if you guys are doing replenishment tasks, you can actually commit that product so it cannot be moved virtually, like meaning I cannot move it with RF Loki or with Easy Ops, but I could move it with RF Task. A task has been created for me to move that product from one location to another. Another reason I see committed is um, product being com coming back from the trade. If you see it in star good, but it's committed, not until register runs are you able to actually move it out of the star good location. Um, let's see some other things. Um, if anyone has run PAL build or WebTL, that product has actually been committed from that pick location to be picked um, by someone later on. So I can't physically move it anywhere else in the warehouse. And the last one, I see this one a lot. Um, customers will set up a location and they will mark it as um, does not hold sellable product or not available for sale, one of those two things, depending on what version you're using. If you do that, all of the product in that location actually commits to that one location and you cannot move it, and you also will not be able to sell that product from there. So if you mark an, a location as a committed, uh, it'll prevent salesmen from actually knowing that that product is available to sell later on. So those are some of the reasons you might see the committed or that highlighted option in RF. Okay, let's see here. Um, can we clear out only star good or does a clear empty all, uh, or does a clear empty all the locations? So I think I'm kind of understanding what's happening here. And if I don't, you know, feel free to, to write in another question. You can always clear um, one whole location you cannot choose certain products to be moved out of that location. Um, so for instance, if your star good has empties, but it also has you know, actual product that you're trying to sell, you can't pick and choose which products are gonna be moved out of there using the auto slot feature. Um, if you run auto slot, or I assume that's what you're looking for, the clear out um, of that location, um, that will actually move everything to the forward pick location. If it doesn't have something assigned as a forward pick, it won't move at all. Um, the other thing I'm trying to think of, if you did have something that you wanted to move just a few things out of the star good, but not everything, that's where I would go right to Easy Ops or RF Loki and start moving that product or those layers um, in a manual fashion as well. Let's see here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, open this up and have you guys go ahead and keep putting in questions. Um, I'm going to basically leave it open for another five minutes. Type in anything you guys can think of. Um, you can also email me later on as well. Um, 
and I will send out the uh, Q&A at the end. Um, I do want to go back to the uh, PowerPoint real quick here. Um, there we go. So in June, I'm going to do IQ Inven and troubleshooting. So basically, again, really an LBI focus, but you'll even if you're not LBI, you'll probably get some things out of it for IQ Inven. But I'm going to go into that audit log. We're going to look at how to make sure you know the on hand, the SS prepar, and all those good things. And then even just some basic troubleshooting things that I can think of. Uh, if you guys have any questions you want addressed, in that session, by all means, feel free to email me. So thanks for attending. And like I said, I'll leave it open for a few minutes and write in all your questions.